we're drawing to an end of one whole phase of evolution, but the last little bits are going to be covered much, much more thoroughly than all of the big hunks that come before it. And uh, so what the first half of evolution is, is a greater and a greater and a greater concentration. And so we began our concentration talking about the great periods, Saturn, Sun, Moon, and now we're talking about the Earth period. And in talking about them, we talked about them as periods of time. And within them, there were uh, forms of experience, and those forms were called uh, globes. And the interaction of consciousness or of spirit working on matter over a long period of time in different global forms resulted in revolutions of consciousness. Now we talked about rests in between, and then we talked about the earth period per se. We've been talking, this is the third talk about the earth period, which is the fourth creative day the day that we are in the middle of right now. And uh, we've been talking first about the first three revolutions, Saturn revolution, in which we recapitulated our physical body. And we recapitulated our physical body in order to be prepared for the indwelling spirit, uh, especially to work through the mind. And for that end, a brain and a nervous system was built into the physical. And in the sun revolution, through the uh, seven globes, oops, that's an earth, it's not a sun. In the sun revolution, the uh, uh, vital body was rebuilt to uh, specialize in things like nervous fluid and other means for taking perceptions from the physical back into the spiritual because the uh, vital body now is in its uh, animal stage of development, its animal-like stage of development, its third stage, and it's almost as well developed as the physical. Uh, so much so that there is, for every organ in the physical, there is a corresponding etheric <coughs> organ that holds it together. And... Uh, the work of the sun period sometimes gets undone if people become too solar-like and too egocentric and self-centered. They pull away to themselves, and sometimes the pulling away is such that they damage the etheric brain, and you have someone who has a, a spastic discontinuity that uh, the spirit inside can't bring things through the whole of the etheric brain and into the physical and experiences from the physical don't all register back to the brain with a complete self-consciousness. And then we talked about the moon revolution in which the desire body was rebuilt. In the desire body, we talked especially about the work of the desire body being stratified. That is, uh, it was, it, it, you can't say fractured and you can't say segregated, but it was done in such a way that there was a separate organization. And in the higher desire material and in the potential higher desire material of the developing desire body was built a second self, which is called a higher self, which is called a lower self, but it serves the function of being together with the mind and uh, forming a personal ego to take care of us sort of instinctually until the spirit draws in. So that's what we're doing. Now we're going to look at the... Uh, uh, we looked... Those, so those, those three, three... Those are the first three revolutions of the Earth period, spinnings through the globes going from within out and from without back in. And now we're in the fourth revolution of the fourth uh, 
creative day and we are on the fourth globe. We are on the earth globe. We're on the earth of the earth of the earth. You recognize that this is a uh, very difficult thing that we're talking about because uh, we talked a long time ago about unity in divinity, that the oneness of the divine is carried all the way through by analogy, so that even so that see unity implies simplicity, and everyone in their own way understands God in the simplest everybody knows that they are or that existence is and in that they sense with their own kind of reverence the nature of God. That is a re-statement of unity. Unity is something that brings simplicity through all of this complexity. We said all of this complexity was to give us all kinds of experiences and all kinds of experiences played off against each other with uh, starting with some very simple principles, but uh, deviations upon deviations upon deviations, it becomes uh, the same thing played over and over again so that it gets so complex that it's very hard to understand it. And unity, working through complexity, is accomplished by analogous interactions. So that any time we hear the word earth, we have a quality of the earth revolution or the earth globe or the earth period, the same ideas manifest on different levels. And so it works analogously. Uh, hmm. So what we've been looking at is alternating periods of manifestation and rest and manifestation and rest. And as we've gone on, we've sort of microscoped in on things. Because as we get closer to our time of existence, we can understand it better because it's closer to us and because it's more in the world of specialization and more in the world of being very concrete so that even though it's, things are most complex now, we can look at one little simple thing at a time. In, in a way, you can say what we've done is sort of like saying, you could say uh, on one level, you could give a biography of someone and say uh, that person was born, they were a child, uh, then they went through an adolescent stage, and then they were a youth, and then they were mature, and then they were aged, and then they died. And you could give that as a formula and it would be perfectly accurate. It would say what their life was like in a broad, very broad, vague way. And what we, that's precisely what we've done in talking about the earlier periods. We've talked about them sort of like saying, well, we were born and we went through this mineral-like existence. Much of what happened then and the amount of consciousness that was poured into us and the kinds of experiences that we had, they're much simpler than what we have now, but much of what we experienced was passed over. Because if, you know, if these talks are tedious the way it is, they would have been much, much, much more tedious to have, you know, like if we did a day-by-day -day account of someone's life, rather than, you know, like maybe on one day, uh, you know, when somebody was uh, a young woman, uh, she had an enlightenment. And that would be a big, a big moment, and you'd want to talk about that. But you don't want to talk about, well, uh, on day 6,224, the person got up five minutes late, and they ate their cereal in bigger gulps. We couldn't do that. It would be totally unfair to do that. So we... Uh, uh, we've been waiting until it's crucial or very important to uh, do things in detail. But the details are important. Even when we have the big picture, the details are important. There's one of those lovely old maxims that applies to all of this. 
And it says that the mills of God grind slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. It gets, when it comes down to what happens in the cosmos, it goes further than just what happened to us every day. Every moment, every thought that we think, and the full meaning of every thought and all the ramifications, all of that is recorded in the cosmos. Of all of the millions and billions of people that are incarnating and reincarnating, and of all of the other beings in the cosmos, no thought is lost. And so it comes down to every thought being very, very important. So the whole business is... We're going to start looking even more in detail now. Uh, the whole business has these revolutions or spirals within spirals within spirals. Now, there have been people that have actually tried to make representations of what the primordial atom is like. They try to do it in physical uh, perspective. And they try to describe what the cosmos is like. And they describe it... Oh, that's really hard to do. Well, I guess we can do it that way. They make a seven-looped spiral like that. It's a figure-eight type of spiral, which is called the Lemniscat spiral. And uh, it's usually described more heart-shaped, and it's more tapered. It's tied together. It's all tied together as one string of consciousness. And so you have this... Let me try doing it over again. So you have this great big... Oops, let's just say that it comes together like this. That's just a very rough drawing. It connects together, and this indicates the outer part of evolution. Then there's a similar caduceus of Mercury-like that is part of the same business that is the inner part. And all of these spirals... We, you know, like you can say the big loops are like the days of creation and what turns into another dimension. And even you can try and do this with, with graphic representation is like the great cosmic rests. As much as you can do this, you've got to remember this is a materialistic re representation. And, uh, and then the, the center, the archetypal idea of the whole primordial atom is like the caduceus of Mercury that runs down the center. So the big loops are like the days of creation. But each of the days of creation has a similar spiral on it that has the seven revolutions of consciousness. And in those seven revolutions of consciousness is another little spiral. And this is still only the rough part. And within those seven revolutions of consciousness, there are the solidification into the different globes. And within the solidification into the little, into the globes, on each of the globes, there are epochs. Now, all of this is all tied together continuously. So that, uh, if you look like, you know, like you're just making a little turn in a figure eight, like such, you can notice that you're doing the big turning. But it's like the earth. The earth, to all intents and purposes, looks flat when it's really curved. And our projection through time seems to be linear and seems to be without much change, but actually there are revolutions. And somebody it gets right down, this whole system gets broken down to the hours of the day are part of this same system. So all of cosmic time, the moment that is the whole of the solar creation, right down to even minutes, and I'm sure it works for smaller subdivisions, but I don't know how, 
is all tied together in one very, very complex cosmic atom. And it's all like a great big heart-shaped uh, lemniscat spiral. Yes. What? Could you do a diagram of how this works together? No. Okay. So it's a very materialistic conception and it's amazingly complex. Amazingly complex. But the thing to remember is that if we have the concentration, if we have the concentration and the ability to center then we can handle more and more of the complexity. We can see the bigger and bigger spirals and we can see all of the littler detailed spirals because the more concentration we have in centering ability, the more unity we have. And the more unity we have, the more simplicity we have. And you can the greater the simplicity that, that you focus on, the greater the ability to handle complexity. If one sets out to have a complex style of living, it will never work. But if one sets out to understand simple fundamentals, then the most complex things can be broken down in a very easy way or can even be sustained all at one time. So this is a very, very uh, complicated thing. It works out in such a way, uh, I've mentioned it a little bit in the astrology class, that there's a representation. Uh, this is too bad this class isn't Friday because it would have been just perfect because there is a representation that we celebrate the cosmic spiral at this time of the year. And uh, Friday is May Day. And there used to be the festival of the May in which the uh, they had... They would set up a, a, a maypole. Sometimes they cut it out of a maple tree, so it was a maple maple. I just wanted joking on that. Uh, and they would have streamers, different color streamers, around the maypole. And people would dance with garlands of uh, flowers in their hair. They would dance... They would rotate around the maypole, and as they rotated around the maypole, they would produce bands, and it would, so that there would be. And as they got, as the bands wrapped more and more around the maypole, they would get closer and closer, and they would get tighter and tighter. And that's just like what we're describing now, that we're getting closer and closer to the center of all things, but the maypole would then be seen, there would be bands like uh, red and orange and yellow and uh, green and blue and violet and uh, red and such like that, and it would be striped. And uh, you can say then, in one way, progressing this way, the maypole is a progression in time that is segmented that is the spiral, there's, there's a continuous spiral, a continuous line so that all the reds are really connected together, but in the linear time down the maypole, they appear as different bands. So that if you look in one dimension at the maypole, it looks like you're seeing different uh, bands of color. Uh, but they're all the same color. And this actually works out in our, it works right out into the hours of the day. You can break them up from sunrise to sunset. Uh, the Holy Sabbath, uh, that means that the first hour after sunrise on Saturday is always ruled by Saturn. And so the whole, and, and if you take 24 hours a day uh, and you break it into the sequence of seven using Sun, Venus, Mercury, Moon, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, seven days later you count uh, 24 hours, uh, every 24 hours being, you know, each hour being ruled by a different planet, when it gets to be the first hour after sunrise again, on um, seven days later, it will again be ruled by Saturn. So, like, there is this continuous uh, segregation of time. It works out that there are 35-year periods in, in this whole schema of things. And within these 35-year periods, uh, they have different rulerships also, just like the days of the week. 
are tied together with the hours of the day and the 35-year periods are all tied together. So it turns out that in the same way that you can't pass ribbons, the red person is never going to lay down a yellow strip or a blue strip. The red person is always going to be laying down a red strip. And it turns out that if you have to be a red person by the nature of your character, you can only be born within a certain strip of time. And you know what I'm trying to say? That for to be out of time would be to like to be wearing clashing colors. And you just would not fit in with your times at all. And so this is a, a, a very big thing, but it, it's complicated and it's, you know, it's, uh, it produces a word that uh, describes it. It's associated with a myth. It's associated with the myth of uh, Daedalus. And who was Daedalus' son? Icarius. And uh, they produced what was called the cosmic maze. And the feeling one gets when understanding the totality of all of this and all of the permutations and combinations is amazement. Is uh, where the word comes from. And that's sort of the kind of awe that we should treat this material with. All right. I probably run away from my notes again. Okay, so we're dealing with now a smaller division of time. We're not dealing with the hours of the day or the 35-year periods. We're dealing with what are called epochs. But before looking into that, we have to look into some things that we... Uh, the pole, the May pole is there. And on one direction is the direction of spirit and time, and in the other direction is the direction of matter and space. We talked about these as being the two poles within the absolute, within the ever becoming. And these two poles also are manifest in what we're talking about. So that when it comes down to the uh, uh, to the fourth revolution of the Earth period on the fourth globe, and things are broken into seven states. Those seven states are both periods of time which are called epochs. So now we have to treat a very difficult thing. And forms of experience. So that some people say that Polaris is a place. They're looking at the form of the experience. Some people say that uh, uh, Polaris is a time. And uh, that's more where their orientation is. The same thing for uh, Polaris and Hyperborea and Lemuria and Atlantis and our current Ariana to be followed by the Galilean epoch, and I don't know what the, what the names are for uh, succeeding epochs. But the point I'm trying to make is, is that we're going to be looking at something now that is a state or a form of matter and experience, and something that is a state of time or consciousness that is associated. The two run in parallel in the same way that there can't be a period without there also being globes for manifestation. That's what the whole process of evolution is about. As we said last time, that one of the primary things is to gain new experience. And the experience can't come about except by forms of experience. Now, Eventually, a few talks down the line, we're going to have to talk about some of these forms which on the crystallizing way down we're very form-oriented. Now that we're on the way up, we can't use the same word. But some of these forms are sometimes called, they're called Atlantean races. 
And so we're going to have to deal with the conception of race. And uh, hopefully we're going to deal with it very open-mindedly. We're not going to uh, uh, shy away from dealing with the experience itself, with the reality, but uh, we're also not going to get hooked into the form. All right, so we're now looking at epochs. We're looking at bands within bands, and we're looking now at the formation of the Earth in particular among the planets. We're, we're, we're talking about the Earth globe within all of the globes put together being globe, uh, the Earth globe of the seven globes. And we're, we're going to focus especially on this planet. Okay. Gee whiz, we'll be all done in two hours and 16 minutes. No wonder there's only so, so few people. Now, what we're coming down to now is where cosmology is not considered cosmology. See, what happens, we're trying to avoid, we're looking at what would be called history. Or what some people see as prehistory. And from a spiritual point of view, history is not just a recording of events that happened and some speculation about what it could have meant to us. It's not that at all. Nor is it a tangent of time that's just going on that one thing is going to happen and there will be some causes that will lead to other things and that will go on and that there's no purpose in it, there's no direction to it. The spiritual viewpoint of history is history is just an extension of cosmology into our into what we can remember from our recent experience. Eventually all of the whole of cosmology will be history to us when we start expanding our consciousness so that we live in the simple moment right now, but we see that moment causally connected and spiritually connected to what preceded it and what opportunities will succeed it. And eventually, there's no, there's no miracle about uh, reading out of the past, uh, out of the memory of nature, or being able to tell the future. There's, that's, no, that's, that's no special case. That is just the case of a person having expanded the now so that the now is so concentrated that we can see how the past and future stream in and out of the present. And so the spiritual view of history is that history is of according to our traditions or according to our collective memories and our tabulation, that part of cosmology that is written down and that we can vaguely understand. But mind you, from a spiritual point of view, history is much different than it is from the historian's uh, books. In the historian's books, it's like who beat who in a war and things like that. And, who wore what kind of clothes and such and all. And uh, it's sort of like, uh, again, taking the example, if we had a biography of somebody and we said on day 1821 at uh, 14 hours and 21 minutes, uh, the person cried. That's what history is like. Uh, if uh, we could see inwardly what was happening to that person, maybe that person had been building up uh, an inward tension and in trying to realize or understand the meaning of something and then in a moment saw that meaning and uh, was so overjoyed at the experience that there was a tearful recognition. That's more like what the spiritual view of history is like. Uh, the spiritual view would say, well, why did people wear armor? It certainly wasn't only to protect themselves, but the wearing of armor being encased in a metal shield did something to their consciousness. It had them in sort of like a, uh, a reverse orgone generator or something for a while that they were experiencing something that way. Or like all of the people that ate sour foods or, or that eat hot foods or something like that have something that happens to their consciousness and they are promoted 
uh, in their evolution through having this kind of experience. You know, it's not a mistake that uh, a lot of the Germans, uh, that the Germans have had a certain kind of temperament and they, they're stubborn and all like that. And the fact that they eat a lot of potatoes and that they eat a lot of soury foods like sauerkraut and sauerbrot and all of those things, that uh, that those kind of experiences are an expression of character, but they are but from that but they're also intended to to manifest and develop a certain type of character, and that's what we're talking about. We're trying to talk about having a clairvoyant perception of a long-term view of evolution and relate it like in a historical kind of fashion where more of the incidents and events and such like that are brought to, to our consciousness. Okay. Now, we're all set to begin where we left off last time. We talked about very, very holy material. What we said last time is what can open up seership. We said that in the concentration and focus of consciousness in the Almighty of our solar system, the being we refer to as God, that as God went deeper and deeper into concentration, that rings or waves, so like it's throwing a stone in the water, waves in circles formed around the center. Well, they started from the outside in and that these waves occurred at different uh, mathematical relations to each other and according to what is called Bode's Law. And Bode's Law has to do with something about the nature of the concentration of God in the forming of the solar system. And at the same time that these waves were formed in a like standing waves as permanent waves, the whole business began to spin faster and faster and faster. And within these waves, as they formed, spinning whirlpools formed. And in those spinning whirlpools, the planets congealed out of the stuff of the Earth as it became more and more dense. And in effect, they were thrown off from the consciousness of God, which became more and more centrally focused, though it is everywhere at the same time, it became more and more centrally focused with that ball that is now called the sun. So that in a way the planets were thrown off or they, they were let off because they couldn't stand the center of vibration any more than one can stand to see God face to face. Even in our most intense prayers and when we are the most of the highest integrity and the most self-honest, to be able to directly confront the center of intelligence in the cosmos in our prayers is a very, very difficult thing to do. In fact, as we get closer in our prayers, we can, like, talk closer to face to face, but we don't actually do it. And so some of us had to be left off in different places, and uh, we lucky ones were left off on Earth uh, for our very special work here on Earth. Okay, and we said that same thing happens within us every time we pray or meditate or concentrate. We set up a revolving center that also has waves in it. And according to the speed and the frequency and the way we set up the waves, we open up different kinds of seership. We talked about the way that uh, uh, when people first begin to be sensitive in their prayers, uh, they start seeing like a big pinwheel of light, which we as kids, uh, we were all told before, because it, it, uh, it was kids' gossip in those days. They said, watch it when they give you the ether to have your... Uh, to have your uh, tonsils off, the last thing you're going to see is you're going to see this pinwheel. And everybody looked for the pinwheel and then waited for the ice cream after you came out of the ether because you, you were told that after you had your tonsils off in order to soothe your throat from all the uh, hot, harsh irritation, you got an ice cream cone for your first meal. You know, it's a, sort of a bribery or a treat for having your tonsils out. And everybody looked and tried to describe seeing the pinwheel before they went out with either. Yeah, do, you, do you remember any of that? For, uh, in, 
Oh, yeah, the, the kid's lore about having your tonsils out. The same thing then happens whether we're knocked out with ether or whether we're entering into a, a deeper and better prayer or meditation. The same law is there. We're talking about the stuff of initiating ourselves into the cosmos because the same way the cosmos is created is uh, uh, is like our meditations are created. We're formed literally in the image of God. And God is a spiritual being and spiritual beings meditate and they bring their dreams into realization through that kind of a prayer and meditation. And the same thing that is there, the same way that we feel wonderful when we've had a new idea or we understand something better. Same thing happens with God, individually and collectively. It's like uh, it's like it says in the uh, uh, in the uh, Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, and the gods looked on their creation and it was good. And every step along the way, it says, hey, we did a great thing. Uh, it's the same thing that happens as with us. We're far afield from the notes again, so we'll who maybe end up being a long talk to get back to, to everything. I, all right. Now we want to review some other thoughts we've had. We remember going back to the Saturn period. And in the Saturn period, we were lumps. And that was what we offered, was our lumpiness. We were mineral-like. And uh, we gave different beings, like the lords of the uh, mind, for example, the opportunity to make snowballs and whatever else they made out of us with their thoughts. Uh, and that's a likely thing. I, I think there's even, this is going to sound awfully silly, it may be straining at a gnat, but you know, in mythology, uh, uh, different divinities were given different gifts, and one of them was a ball. And when people are kids are playing with snowballs and things like that, they're dealing with you know very divine stuff. If you give a ch a child uh, uh, a string, uh, a stick, a ball, and a box, you've given them all the fundamentals that they need to understand anything in the cosmos. You've given them the very best toys of all. The earthy ma imagination they can. They can use that box to be anything from a house to a spaceship to whatever. And, you know, the point, line, and circle, obviously, are the uh, ball, the stick, and the string. Because uh, the stick and the string, you know, when we make these circles, this is nothing more than a stick and a string. Yet, uh, we'll solve that simply. You can even do it with just a string if you like. Okay. So, we were stuck. What we offered to the world in the Saturn period was our body. I wouldn't even say our bodies because what was more important was us as a body collectively. It's like the whole of the minerals are important more as a collective body than as individual atoms. Then in the uh, Sun period, we offered vitality to the world in the same way the plants offer vitality right now. And then in the Moon period, what we offered to the world was our feelings, our emotions, our desires, our motivations. Those were what we gave to the world in the same way that we can understand the pride of a cock of the walk. When we see the rooster strut his stuff, we did that same thing. We emanated those kinds of feelings into the cosmos as our gift. Now, one of the things we want to point to in, into where we're trying to get tonight, because what we're going to talk about descriptively tonight is nothing. This is, all, this is one of those that's all uh, introduction, this talk. Uh, no talk, only introduction. Uh, and then we come, and then next time we'll have, we'll talk about Lemuria, and then we'll take the long break for summer, and then we're going to talk for a number of talks about what is called the fall of humanity. And we're going to talk about some very heavy things. We're going to talk about sin. We're going to bring in demons. And we're going to bring in the Bible. And we're going to bring in a whole bunch of things. And uh, uh, Because as we get closer to our own times, it gets thicker and thicker. What is our service now is, in the earth period, is our thinking.
more than any other way, it's only because we have goofed and have had to have some of our experience in a very physical way that uh, we do the other kind of service, like digging ditches and uh, such like that. But eventually, we are ripe for thinking. And our primary service to the cosmos as human beings is to think. The two functions of the mind, to think and remember. We're going to have a very special talk about thinking and remembering somewhere on down the line. So, thinking is our activity. Now comes an important conception. The principle of analogy, you know, we talked last time that we're a special first fruits of the cosmos because we are in our most developed state or in our most physically manifest state at the same time that the cosmos is. We are the shuttlecock for the cosmos. We had our mineral state when the cosmos was in its mineral-like state, and we have the fulfillment of our physical bodies at the time that there is the most ramified fulfillment of the solar cosmos. Now, all of this happens in parallel. It happens Again, analogously, it happens macrocosmically and it happens microcosmically. This is to say that at the same time that the Earth is hardening, in it with, you know, it's being thrown off within the sun, it's becoming more and more solid, we individually are becoming more and more solid until we are as we are now. We're very dense. But at the same time, we are waking up our creative propensities such that the spirit is now coming closer or more becoming indwelling and actually becoming a creative being in this whole process. So that as the earth and the other planets are congealing and humanity the humanity that is on all of the different planets, is developing its thought potential, we are actually a creative and a causal factor in the condensation of the Earth. And it ha this is, a, this is a, a thread of consciousness that we're going to follow all the way through uh, Lemuria and Atlantis and uh, our own times into the Galilean epoch uh, after the earth is dissolved, we, by our thinking, are making the earth. Now, this is one of the most practical reasons why this course is offered at all, even though nobody is interested in it, that if we understand the formula, the formulae of the cosmos, and if we understand the primordial atom, and if we produce thought, and even the way we develop the thought, if we do it the way the cosmos does it, and our thought is harmonious with what is ripe in the cosmos, we're not going against the grain, but we're actually participating much more fully in the creative work itself. And if we understand what we're doing, then we can focus on why we are here and we can fulfill why we are here much more expeditiously. We can do much more service. We can accomplish much, much more if we understand why this is all taking place as it's taking place in the first place. So even though they seem to be very, uh, uh, seem to be very far-fetched talks, they're meant to be very practical talks so that every principle and that every stage and state that we can understand it, that we can look out and see, oh, this is what's going on. It's still, it's still going to be awfully slow because we have to get some lessons over again and again and again before we say, oh, my goodness, I should have known that all the while. It, but uh, still, if it's, if it's right before us, we can, uh, we can see it all the more clearly. So everything, we are the beings that are bringing it into, uh, uh, into, be into being, 
And uh, so collectively, humanity and the gods and individuals are bringing all of this about. Uh, the uh, whole process is our thought is we're thinking. You know, you know, we don't know this, but does a mother know that she's thinking when she is working through the ethers and gestating a new physical body? The only way that the mother knows it is because it's like all spiritual creative states is she feels more sleepy because more of her attention is withdrawn from the physical, uh, outer physical, and it's put into the uh, intrauterine activity. And so that the consciousness is turned in there, and the mother is, in fact, creatively thinking and creatively participating and consolidating that body. And so the same thing is happen with, happening whether people know it or not. This is what we're doing in the world. We're actually changing the world. We're actually focusing on an archetype that is there. It's sort of like reading music. When you're reading the music, you understand what you're supposed to do, but you still have to put the interpretation, you still have to put the meaning into it. You still have to make it be. And in an unconscious way, there is a creative archetype, not in the, sen in the Jungian sense of archetype, but more like the ancient Greek sense of archetype, uh, there is an archetype that we've talked about just before, this great cosmic atom, and we see this sort of almost in a Hegelian sense, this light following along the thread, and the light is, you know, is in one way a big focus, and in some ways it's a very little focus, and as it follows a, along the Ariadne's thread, that is the whole of this entire spiral, we're following that. And if we follow that, we can unsee it unfold, just like we can see chord after chord resolve in music, and we understand what the composer meant when he wrote this piece of music, and it's very much like that. We're thinking uh, at the same, you know, we're, we're bringing it into being, only in the case of music, it's, it's very, uh, very obvious. So we're at a point now that in the first three revolutions, and in the first three and one-half epochs, of the fourth globe of the fourth revolution, we're unconsciously thinking, and we're becoming we're becoming human beings, wide awake thinkers, and we're becoming more wide awake all the time, uh, but we're only just becoming, and so we're still receivers, and still we get most of it from the archetype, and most of it from the influence of the gods or the guardian angels and all of the beings that are directing us, and eventually we're coming to the point where right now we're more awake and we're becoming part of the creators. We're going to follow this all along until eventually many, in this, many more of the gods are going to retire. We've talked earlier about the different gods retiring and talk about having to drive a car through freeway traffic winding in and out. Eventually, we're going to have to all get along with each other so well that we collectively focus on the thread of consciousness for the whole earth and that when the returned Christ leaves from being the central focus in the earth, we will move the earth through the dimensions and into the different threads of the cosmos and we'll do this as a collective activity. And we'll do it sort of like, again, using a musical analogy, We'll do it like musicians creatively improvising, but that the improvisation in no way takes away from the main theme that's being developed in the music. All right, so we're becoming givers, and uh, we're becoming uh, 
uh, we are actually the beings that are developing and changing the earth. We are the beings that, that are accomplishing all of this. All right? Now, we're all set to talk about the Polarian Epoch and the beginnings of the birth of the earth. Polaris <coughs> means of the pole. There are materialists and revisionists that feel that uh, Polaris in the Polarian epoch, see, some people think it only in terms of form. They think that there is a place on the earth that was Polaris, or they think there's a place on the earth that was Hyperborea. Most people think that there was a blessed continent that was at the north pole of the earth, and that this is what Polaris was. Not quite so. Polaris, we have to remember the use of the word earth. If you remember... We're in the Earth period. But the whole Earth period is for the whole of the solar system. And the solar system began very far out. We saw that it went beyond the reaches of the orb of Uranus. We saw last week because that was the first planet that was thrown off as the central attention was withdrawn. Uh, it was elimination and a creation. Planets are both an elimination of what the divine can't use directly in its spiritual meditation. So it's sort of like uh, it's a very scorpionic principle that we eliminate things by setting them off. But when we set them off, we can objectify them. And when we can objectify them, we can uh, creatively work with them. So the whole of the solar system was sort of like a big, loose, floppy wall of light. And as, as this concentration went on, it became smaller and smaller and more and more dense. And because of the laws of nature being what they are, it flattened out until it got to be the point now where there's just one ball and all of the flattening is in a band in that all of the little globes are at where the rings are, like the rings in Saturn, uh, only they're all transparent. They're more in the ethers of space rather than in the physical stuff of space. Now, a valid use of the word Earth is this what is symbolized by that globe. But Earth also represents the whole of this big glob or this disk. So that the entire ecliptic, if you read in a lot of ancient texts, Earth means the entirety of the ecliptic. And so all of this spinning mass also had a pole. And when we're speaking of Polaris, this is what we're speaking about. We're speaking about the uh, recapitulation in an epochal uh, level of manifestation of the Saturn period and the Sun period. In the Saturn period and the Sun period are where we got the germ of the divine spirit and the life spirit. And they are beyond ego consciousness. Ego consciousness came in the moon period when the uh, human spirit or self was developed, even though it wasn't awakened. You know, the problem of uh, that uh, many Buddhists especially, they try to get beyond themselves or they try to transcend themselves. 
And there is something about the divine spirit and the life spirit that are pure, that are universal, that are uh, uh, non-contaminated by the principle of personal selfhood or individual selfhood. And what corresponds to them, the way this works out, I just this is a little side trip, uh, but it's, it's really beautiful the way all of this works out. In the Polarian Epoch, and the uh, Hyperborean Epoch, things were still in the ethers. <coughs> Things were still in a much more spiritual, gaseous state. And they weren't made into discrete globes or tangible bodies until the Lemurian epoch. See, what I'm saying is that it's, it's so beautiful that the qualities of the spirit, the qualities of the transcendental spiritual consciousness, are reflected again by analogy, even in the way forms take place in the earth. So Polaris does not mean the North Pole of the earth. Polaris means the pole of this revolving energy stuff that is gradually condensing, you made most of it anyway, that is gradually condensing and gradually uh, becoming externally manifest. So, when we're talking about Polaris, we're talking about the pole of the sun, or of the solar system, because it really wasn't the sun as we know of the sun now. It's, you have to be careful about the use of these words. It would be misleading, and people would say, ah, oh, he said that all, all wrong. And you want to confuse people and put them down a wrong way of thinking. Now, there are some analogies, though, with the uh, pole of the Earth. If we take the globe that is the Earth, there are differences of activities. At the axis, things are much more time-oriented. Do you know that you can walk around the Earth in two seconds, all you have to do is turn around like that, and you've gone all the way around the Earth. Whereas if you do that at the uh, equator, it's 26,000 miles. It takes an enormous amount of time. And up here, right at the tip of the, at the you know, right where the, in, in the, uh, you know, at the, uh, imaginary pole of the earth, it's only an inch, you know, like a, a 45 degrees of space can be only an inch. Whereas 45 degrees of space here is something like, uh, well, a fourth of 26,000 would be six and a half, uh, six and a half thousand miles. So there's a lot of space, there's a lot of distance involved with axial rotation. So there are, what I'm saying is, is that things change more slowly up here and things change much more swiftly because in 24 hours, down, if you're standing here, in 24 hours, you've turned around uh, 26,000 miles. You've gone 26,000 miles of, uh, of, of surface area. But in 24 hours here, you may be only gone, if you're standing at the pole, you've only gone, gone around a few feet. And, and so things move more slowly. Now there are parallels between the physical Earth and uh, what was happening in the sun. What do we know about the physical Earth? It's cold up here. And that cold, there isn't, really isn't cold in the uh, etheric sun and what we're talking about in the Polarian Epoch but things are turning more slowly. And this is like near, on the surface, this is like near the crux of the concentration. This, you know, like the center of the Earth of the solar system would be like the, uh, would be like the crux of things. 
but along the pole on the surface it approximates that. You know what I'm trying to say. All right, so that things start congealing and getting heavy here. And in the same way that we have ice caps in the, uh, on the Earth, this is the way, this is where the, at the poles of the sun that was solar system that was flattening out and uh, getting more and more dense is where all of this activity took place. So Polaris was the beginning of the congealing out of the gaseous ethers of the stuff that is becoming the chemical matter, the solids, the liquids, and the gases that we now have as our as our um, playground of existence. But there is a movement. You know, the poles, given the chance, they'll creep down to the creep down to the uh, equator, and uh, if something is thrown off, that equator is like where the flattening is, where these rings are, where the planets formed. So things are thrown off at the equator, or form becomes so much, it becomes so crystallized at the equator that it has to, it becomes sometimes so dense that it has to be flung off, even if the flinging off is within. So there is a movement from pole to equator that things go from spiritual more toward material. And then there is an abstraction that goes the other direction from material experience, the understanding of form goes back in toward from the equator toward the pole. We've talked about that in the astrology class quite a bit, and I don't want to be repetitious about it. Uh, we'll, we'll pass uh, on talking much more. So then, we were not mineral-like as we were in the Saturn period, but we were mineral humans. That is to say, we were mineral humans, that we had a becoming dense body or a, a materializing dense body. We had an etheric body. We had a desire body. We had a mind that was just coming into focus. And through it, the threefold spirit was coming close to touching. So we had all of the things that make for a human being. The threefold spirit, the individuality, and the fourfold body the personality. And, but the thing is, it's so beautiful. We were like the uh, solar system itself. We were baggy. Our bodies were huge. And there were, there were like the Earth, it was indefinite. And they were, we were all like single cell kinds of beings. And in the center of the single cell, there was the controlling mechanism from the etheric body that was in charge of the con condensing. The etheric has the effect of uh, being the matrix or the form. You know, like uh, modern biologists are now finding out that there is a form to a plant that surrounds it, and it can actually be measured by electronic equipment, though etheric vision is far, far better. Uh, and that etheric form exists before the, before the plant exists or before the animal exists. And uh, they're even starting to measure now when the energy goes out of the energy field, the matrix, and into the form and becomes the object. And in the same way, that's what we were doing. Uh, we do that with every rebirth and every, everything that comes into existence like this. And the same thing was happening with the solar system. But there is a control mechanism that the etheric is in control of it and controls the timing because in the physical, you know, the physical is basically a resistant form. And that control mechanism is still the control mechanism today uh, because in embryology, where we start out sort of like as a single cell again, uh, the first cell that is differentiated in the uh, impregnated egg is in fact the cell that is the, contains the seed atom of the heart. 
that he is the remembrance of all of our past lives. That's the first cell that's differentiated. Second cell that differentiates of a different kind is the cell that is associated later on. This is, of course, according to clairvoyant research and myself not being clairvoyant that I can look in there and watch cell for cell how it happens, but they have these kind of classes in the inner world. The second cell that is differentiated is a pineal cell. And uh, the pineal is uh, the, the, all of the endocrine glands, according to spiritual science, uh, are solidifications out of the etheric body. They don't, they're not affected by the nervous system. They're not really even much physically affected. They communicate only with each other. And they communicate only through the, uh, uh, through the blood, through the gaseous part of the blood, more than through the uh, uh, liquid part of the blood. And... Uh, so the guiding mechanism for us was the pineal gland, which at that time stuck out of this big single cell kind of bag is the way it's described. And it was sort of a heat sensor, and it guided us where we needed to go by heat. And so we as human beings then were thinking, and we were waking up, and the only differentiation we had was a sense of feel and a sense primarily only of warm and cold in field, in, in field, and we were sort of guided around in this polarian beginning to congeal part of the solar system. And uh, our work then was beginning to think about a physical body, and a physical body, the way we procreated, the cells just split the same way they do in the embryo. Uh, it was uh, our, we were on a, on a singular level, and the new consciousness would focus through the uh, through the new pineal focus. All right, um, I'm way ahead of my notes or out of my notes. Yeah, I guess that covers that all pretty well. We're almost all done already. So what we're talking about is we then recapitulated a mineral-like sense. And in that mineral-like sense, we learned by the feeling of sensation. And the feeling of sensation is now the most generalized in our body, like uh, taste and smell and sight and sound are all localized to special organs, and they're all generally localized to the head. Whereas the sense of heat and uh, the other sensational forms which were associated with the pineal gland, which still, you know, like you eat ice cream, you know, where you get, where you get that headache in the center of your head if you eat ice cream too fast or hold it against the root of your mouth, right in that area where the pain is, is the area where the pineal is. It was, so all right, I don't, I didn't want this to be a lecture on the pineal gland by, by any means. So, that was our Polarian type of experience. Then there was a rest. And after that rest, we polarized our consciousness even further, and we, con we concentrated even deeper, and we became plant human beings. And these plant human beings were called Hyperboreans. And the word Hyperborea means literally like in the fairy tale, beyond or behind the north wind. Uh, Boreas is the north hyper is way up north or beyond or behind it. And again, there are revisionists. Uh, some people feel that Hyperborea was Greenland. Some people feel it was Iceland. And in Greek times, Greek and Roman times, a lot of people took it physically as being the British Isles. And they were called uh, the Isles of the Blessed. You see a lot of people, when they see the drudgery of this world, 
and the limitations of this world, especially since we've had the fall and we've gotten into making mistakes and sinning and such like that, a lot of folks become revisionary and reactionary and they think that the golden age was in the past. And they all feel that the golden age and the golden places, all those noble Hyperboreans, uh, they were they lived up near the North Pole and they were you know, they weren't uh, they were behind the north wind and they lived in those blessed isles up there and the cold never bothered them because they were such holy people and such like that. Really they were plant like human beings. They were much more distended and uh, the, there, were, there was much more vitality. They weren't just sort of baggy things. Uh, but they weren't anything the way we would think of a human being now. Uh, the closest thing that they would come to being like would be like some of these etheric beings that seem to be just e extensions of a field of force. And that they're just long trailing fields of force. And we were still single cell like, but we had more uh, separations within us. And so at the pole of the sun, now the scum was becoming thicker and thicker, and it was coming down, and it was getting ready to become planets, and our consciousness was becoming more and more awake. We were still somewhat like a dreamless sleep, uh, but we were gradually waking up, and uh, we were uh, extending ourselves. We were reaching beyond ourselves. And our Hyperborean existence as human beings was that of, uh, in a way, very pure, not wanting to leave the uh, not wanting to leave the fold of the inner worlds, but extending ourselves in such a way that there was a polarization in our consciousness that had to lead to a condensation, that had to come about to the formation of the planets themselves. And there's not a whole a lot that we can really say about uh, Hyperborea or Polaris for that matter because it's so much beyond our consciousness. It's sort of like our thinking. It's, it's like if you remember a dream in the daytime. Sometimes if you're sitting and you're in a right mood, you can find yourself remembering a dream and know that you experienced that dream at an earlier time. And something like that is what our experiencing now of Hyperborea was like. We were thinking and we were, the thinking was a kind of a remembering. We were remembering and basically, you know, it's sort of like when people do your thinking for you. If you're in a math class, for example, just before the uh, ability to think for yourself if it's an especially difficult uh, problem, you'll be able to follow it while the instructor is putting the formula on the board and you'll follow what you're doing because you're following in the consciousness of the instructor. And then you'll get home, and you'll try to do it yourself and you'll lose it. And you'll go back to your uh, instructor and the instructor will say, this is how you did it and it will be clear again. And you may go home and not be able to get it yet. And so that's what our thinking was like. We were being led by the divine hierarchies and our thinking was more or less like the cosmic thought of God which we were following along in our own minds and precipitating this condensation or precipitating this solidification. And uh, it, we weren't yet waking up, which is what comes now when we talk about the Lemurian epoch and we're going to spend about at least three talks talking about the <coughs> Lemurian epoch, maybe even more, and then we'll get into Atlantis and such. So next time will be the first, in, the first talking of the Lemurian epoch, and then we'll have the long break for summer, and then maybe everybody will be all eager to come back for more next fall. Ha ha. Uh, we may have four people instead of three. <laughs> but, <laughs> ten. All right. All right, so we now have a little bit of an understanding. It was wonderful to be carried along in a dreamlike state by the gods and to be effortlessly seeing all of these thoughts and doing our thinking. 
uh, almost being having it induced in us by the divine compared to now we think and we think and we think and sometimes nothing comes and then gradually if we keep thinking on something something comes into formation but uh, at least it's ours now because when we think and, and, and manifest the thought we know how we got there and we can do it again and we can creatively bring other deductions <coughs> out of it so though some people might glorify Hyperborean days and Polarian days uh, to, our, to our kind of consciousness they were very primitive in fact that's going to be one of the primary things I'm going to try and debunk is not to say that Atlantean days were horrible or that Lemurian times were uh, just a dearth of our, of our evolutionary consciousness, but there still is a lot of those, there still are a lot of those people that live in the past and they romanticize uh, Atlantis and Lemuria and say they were all so wonderful and they have such misconceptions about them that it's, you know, it's terrible. Everybody knows that living right now, living on into the future is much better than uh, glorifying ourselves in our past. All right, so we'll look at Lemuria next time. Questions? No questions. You'll have to tell Barb to come every now and then. Tell her I'm lonely for people in class because I don't want it to be that I'm one of those mystics that talks to himself by default. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're talking about something like that right now. The whole condensation problem, uh, problem, and that whole phenomenon, is a pro is a. Uh, if there's anything that love needs, love needs to be fruitful. And love, the unity of love, is associated with imagination, and imagination has to realize itself, and that means to bear fruit. And that's why the uh, tree in the Polarian sense is associated with the life spirit and the vital life, whereas the fruit is associated not with the life spirit, but with the human spirit. In fact, even the whole process of uh, generation, uh, sexual generation, is a faculty of the human spirit, the Holy, the Holy Spirit, the Jehovah principle. And it's like saying the Divine Father and the Divine Mother must bear fruit and know themselves. They can only know themselves through the children. And it's a strange thing that it gets perverted that many people do indeed live through their children, which is a great mistake. That's a misuse of a very, very profound spiritual truth. But when people say, well, what's the purpose of life but to get married and have children? In a way that is true, because if you live unto yourself alone in your own dreams and you don't bear fruit or if you don't manifest something, it's a kind of laissez kind of selfishness. And the experience of sacrificing in the form of limitation to bear fruit is what the process of love wisdom is in the form of imagination actually giving birth to objective kinds of forms. Right. Well, that's different way of looking at it, and we're going to look into that in a, in a later talk. Yeah, but that's not quite exactly. Uh, love, wisdom are seen just as two faces of the, of the same sun. Yes. All right. Great.